first of all, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, besides being the CEO of DTL, I'm also the deputy chair for Oil Arctic Line, the ferry company that is responsible for the transport to and from Greenland and also the domestic distribution, and also the chair of Caledonian Maritime Assets, uh, which is the asset owner of ferries and port infrastructure, or a big chunk of it, uh, on the west coast of Scotland. When we talk about lifeline services, uh, there's no doubt that uh, they take a lot of varieties. We have A to B island services, triangle or inter uh, island services. We have services across fjords or locks, and we have coastal feeder services that all sustains and links local remote communities. And the, the word lifeline services actually is a very good word in describing what role these services play to the local communities they serve. The ownership and characteristics of these services, they are typically state-owned, either by the national government or local or municipality. Very often they are diffi very difficult to operate on a pure commercial basis, uh, and very often they are subsidized one way or the other. In some cases, they are operated by private companies or in the end state-owned entities as well under user agreements, concessions, or they are a monopoly uh, operator operated by, for instance, a government and again by tender and award. Very often we will see that government has control over critical elements, for instance, what fare levels uh, are implemented, frequency, and capacity on the ferries uh, that are operating and serving the community. Also, very often, another characteristic is that these vessels are not standardized. They are not sort of just to purchase in the, in the market. They are highly specialized to fit hand in glove to local operating characteristics in terms of draft, in terms of basic, uh, berthing facilities, in terms of capacity, in terms of how uh, they are able to operate in, in the weather conditions uh, in, in a particular area. And last but not least, they are often very costly to operate. Uh, taken out of uh, the, uh, the, latest, uh, the latest Audit Scotland uh, report from, from October uh, in 2016-17, the Scottish government spent more than 200 million pounds on ferry services on assets. I'm on the board myself, a Danish uh, company that just won a 400 million tender contract to operate uh, and service a domestic island uh, over the next 10 years. So it just shows that it's, it is costly to run these kind of services. Some examples, the Scottish West Coast, other examples, Greenland, and we will find these type of lifeline services more or less uh, over the entire Arctic region. In Canada, I've been working myself with uh, ferry services in British Columbia. We will find it in Norway where they have uh, uh, an extensive uh, ferry and, and, and other type of uh, short sea shipping network along the coast. In Denmark, the Baltic States, uh, Scotland, and, and so forth. What we have to bear in mind is that the hinterland infrastructure is an important element in, in, in providing these kind of maritime services. It's not just enough to provide a port and a ferry. The hinterland plays an important role, and it's only uh, the ferry service itself is only one link in a, in a total trans, uh, transport and supply chain, both in terms of cost and also uh, how well it performs if there is a competitive environment. These local services are also affected by what is happening uh, in the global uh, scene, what we see in terms of manufacturing, globalization, global competition, specialization, consolidation, and digitalization. All this leads to increased trade on a global basis and also increased transport volumes. And again, the transport sector faces some of the same elements. An element just like digitalization, we are talking a lot about disruption. But already 60 years ago, when the sea container was introduced, 
that was indeed disruption. When we look at how container volumes have grown and how the container is used to facilitate trade around the world, that was really disruption to traditional cargo flows. And again, in the end, local services need to, one way or the other, be able to deal with, with changed patterns. So they are affected. When we look at some of the challenges and change drivers being able to provide these local services, well, in some cases, requirements to tender, for instance, within EU by EU or national government level. What we see again as a typical is that these fleets, because of their highly specialized nature, have aging, uh, ages, uh, port infrastructure, something that is often operating in harsh environments, needs to constantly be uh, maintained and requires re renewals and investments. There is pressure on government spending. As I said, a number of these services are one way or the other, directly and indirectly uh, uh, subsidized by, by governments. There is pressure on government spending, which again put limits on the ability to invest and do the necessary uh, fleet and port renewals. And then at the same time, as already being discussed here, we see increased environmental uh, demands in terms of uh, uh, various forms of emissions, ship safety, security, lack of qualified staff, and so forth. Change, as I mentioned already, change trading patterns will one way or the other affect in the long term local services and user demands for better services, low affairs, uh, increases for capacity will again put pressures on the public purse. What is important is to look all the time for the operators to look at options to improve and uh, accommodate external changes into the business model. And there are fortunately positive experiences. What we saw in, in Royal Arctic Line, uh, we were able, when, when, we, when I joined back in the beginning of 2014, to actually do quite a lot of things and start improving the earning potential of that particular business which will make us more sustainable to some of the changes that we are going to see in the future. For example, that we are going to con constantly contract and renew the fleet, which has been by far too, too much extended. And of course, that will hit our bottom line in the end, but now we are in a fairly, fairly good position. There are options to do that. We are also discussing with Imskip, and I saw they are speaking later today, to tap into their fleet network. We already ordered a 2,000 plus TU container ship in China that we hopefully, uh, with the necessary approvals from the Icelandic government, will be able to operate uh, in some joint service with Imskip, thereby tapping into the global container network. And on the Scottish space, talking about climate, we have uh, two dual uh, LNG-fueled, uh, uh, powered uh, ships under construction at Ferguson's. The, the first one will be launched tomorrow by the First Minister. And we already have uh, three uh, hybrid ferries uh, that can operate purely on batteries uh, that has been taken into the service over the latest uh, couple of years. So we do indeed have focus there as well on trying to uh, do our part, our share, to contribute to operating more environmentally friendly ferries. I couldn't resist the questions is for later, but I thought this was a very nice picture, so uh, that would uh, give you the opportunity to ask questions later. Thank you. <laughs>